Okay, hello and welcome to lecture two of Electrical Engineering 102. We're going to jump right in. First, some course announcements. The syllabus is available at tinyurl.com slash UCLA102. This is a Google document so that the course staff can update it as information changes. Some of you, a uh, minority of you, have been having trouble viewing the video lectures or course material on CCLE. This can be due to a number of reasons. You might not be enrolled in the class. Uh, you might be uh, waitlisted from another department outside of EE and will not have access to CCLE. So whatever the difficulty is, please email help at seize.ucla.edu. The first homework is due Friday, April 10th at 1159 p.m. Pacific time. That's not this Friday, that is next Friday, okay? Excellent. So the roadmap for this class is to first, in the next two to three weeks, we're gonna build up the basics uh, and properties of signals and systems before discussing advanced topics and applications. So it will feel math heavy. It may even feel like a few disconnected topics, but this is just to build the foundation. Concretely, this lecture is going to cover a few disparate mathematical topics. We'll talk about how signals can be scaled, reversed, and shifted. We'll talk about different types of signal properties. We'll talk about special signals such as sinusoids. We'll talk about causality, energy, and power signals as well as Euler's formula, uh, potentially in a future lecture. So we may cut this lecture off right about here. Okay, so we're gonna keep the first week a little bit light. Okay, let's begin with discrete versus continuous signals. So let's uh, talk about signals. So we have signals, and we have two types of signals. One type is continuous, and the other is discrete. So let's draw what this might look like. If we have a standard one-dimensional signal, then we're gonna just, for the moment, assume that it's sampled in time. This could be any different dimension, doesn't need to be the time dimension, but that's the most natural way of thinking about it. So we have a discrete, uh, we have a, a, a discrete time and a continuous time signal that we're gonna plot on an axis. So this axis would be the signal amplitude. And this other axis here, would be the axis of time. Now, let's start by plotting the discrete signal, uh, the continuous signal. So the continuous signal is gonna be in green, and that might be some signal that looks something like this. Okay. So this is X continuous, so we'll denote that as CTS as a function of time. Now this signal, if we look at it, it has an infinite number of values along its interval. And that's part of what we're gonna study in ECE 102, continuous signals. Now there's another world of signals called discrete time signal processing. In discrete time signal processing, this continuous signal is gonna be sampled at certain time intervals. So we're gonna take this point, this point, this point, and so on. So this would be zero, this would be t, this would be 2t, this would be 3t, and so on. We may also here have samples on the other side, minus t, and so on. Discrete time signals are more common in the real world in terms of the application scenario. For example, you may have a uh, music recording that is digitally captured, or you might have a picture that is captured not on a piece of analog film, but on a digital piece of film which has different pixels that sample the image at different locations. Uh, most of the data that we deal with is in digital or discrete form. However, it's very common uh, to use mathematical tools to understand continuous signals more easily. 
So in this class, ECE 102, we are more interested in continuous signals for ease of mathematical understanding. Just to finish the thread here, if we look at this discrete signal, the discrete signal does have a relationship with the continuous signal. For example, I can write x bracket of n as being the nth sample of the signal. So for example, I could take each one of these red dots here that I'm kind of circling again, I can take each one of those red dots and I can store them in some sort of data stream. For example, I could just store them as a discrete vector or a discrete array. And if I do that, that array might have n elements and the nth index of that element in this case would be equal to the continuous signals the index time the period. So for example, you can see how this would map to this plot. If I have x of one, assume now that we start our signal at zero. So we're gonna assume now that the world starts at t equals zero. We will discuss this more when we get to causality. World starts here. The zero sample then is at uh, time zero. The first sample is at time capital T. The second sample is going to be at time 2t and so on. Okay. So now that we have restricted the scope of EE102 to continuous signals, we can think about how continuous signals can be modified. One way to modify signals is to scale their amplitude. So for example, if I have a signal x of t, then I could apply a simple scaling to that, some constant a x of t. So in this case, I can once again draw a signal let me draw one axis here for the amplitude and the other axis for time. Now I can plot different signals here. Here's my original signal x of t. Okay, this is x of t. If I scale the amplitude, I can, for example, scale it to one half of x of t. So I could do for example, 0 0.5 x of t, which might look something like this. I can also try scaling it up, scaling up the amplitude, let's say 1.5 times x of t, that would be about here. And I can also have a negative amplitude should I choose. So for example, here is minus 0.5 x of t. This is also known as signal inversion. You know, the natural counterpart to amplitude scaling would then be time scaling, as you can imagine. In this case, we write that a signal x of t can be compressed or expanded in time.
Okay, so a signal x of t can basically be multiplied, you can multiply inside the argument, you can multiply the time variable by some constant a. So here's an example of how that might look. We have our axes. Here we have time, and up here we have amplitude. Now, what I can do is I can draw my original signal. So my original signal could be something like this. Okay. So this is x of t. Now, what I can do is I can draw different versions of time scalings with different constants. So here would be one such constant. So as you can see, it's been sort of compressed in time. And here's another variant that has been expanded in time. Okay. Let me draw it a little bit more to scale. Oops, okay. Let's get back our axes. So let's put some numbers here. This is one on the y-axis. Let's say that the halfway point of the signal, which is about 0 0.5 here on the y-axis, that's going to occur at 1, 1. And similarly, one, one. Okay, it's a little bit better to scale. So I'm still kind of learning how to use this tablet here. The green signal, let's say, occurs at zero point five. Zero point five, and let's draw the red signal at two. This is about two. Okay. So these are three different variants. The blue signal here is x of t, and the red signal is x of a r times t, the constant corresponding to red, and the green signal is x of a g t. Okay. Now, in general, uh, when you compress or expand, you have two different options for compression and expansion. So if a equals 1, that would be the original signal. If A is between, is, is you know, uh, let me use the eraser here. If A is between zero and one, um, it's either gonna be a dilation or an expansion. And if A is greater than one, again, it's either gonna be a, a compression or an expansion. So the question to check your understanding is what constants for A determine whether a signal is compressed or expanded? You can follow up by determining the constants for the red signal
and the green signal. Okay, feel free to pause the video and take a crack at determining these constants. Okay, welcome back. So how many of you thought that if A is greater than one, then the signal is gonna expand? How many of you thought that when A was less than one, but greater than zero, that the signal is going to expand? So let's do this out. Let's start with the green signal. If I look at the green signal, the green signal, the halfway point here hits at t equals 0 0.5. So in other words, this point, let me draw this x here. So this is my original signal x of t. This point here, x marks the spot, originally was supposed to occur at t equals one. But now this x marks the spot occurs at t equals 0 0.5, okay? So what's happened? What should the constant of A be? Well, let's plug in numbers and see how this might work out. So if x of um, this x marks the spot in the original signal corresponds to x of one. Okay. And so we know that some constant x of a t has to equal x of one at t equals 0 0.5. Therefore, a equals two. So we can say that if a is larger than one, then this is expansion. If a is smaller than one, then this is compression. Okay, here's a summary of what we just discussed. If a is greater than one, then the signal is compressed in time. If a is between one and uh, zero and one, then the signal expands in time. The key here is if you're ever confused and mix it up, which is very common, then you're always welcome to plug in values of t to make sure that you have compressed and expanded the values correctly. In general, what you can always do when you have these kinds of problems, either on an exam or where you don't have access to resources, is you can come up with a hypothetical signal just like we did earlier. We actually ended up drawing this hypothetical signal Gaussian right here. We defined the full width half max, and then we uh, gave two examples of different scalings of that. So by examples in the last slide, we were able to answer this question of whether, of what constant A determines compression versus expansion. Okay, time reversal. It's also possible to reverse a signal in time. Some of you may have been wondering, the question you may have been asking is, what if A was negative in the previous example. And that brings us exactly to time reversal. A signal x of t can be reversed by replacing t with minus t. Therefore, the reverse signal, which I will write in red here, is going to be x of minus t. So here's an example using a real world signal. I'll draw an axis here. Here's t. This is zero, one, two, three. And let's just say this is some value, let's say two. 
In this particular case, I can draw a signal that looks something like this. Let's say at 0 0.5, it's here. Okay, something like that. Let me draw this a little bit asymmetric so it's clear that we are reversing this. Oops. Okay, so that's kind of your asymmetric signal. It's kind of like a hill. If you're climbing on this hill, you're climbing up the hill. It's like a very gradual hill and then it has kind of a cliff. Okay. Now a reverse version of this might look something like the following. So if it's reversed, this point here, this X marks the spot is actually gonna show up at minus T. So it's gonna show up over here. So if I draw that, that's roughly about here. So you're gonna have, this is two, you're gonna have your sharp cliff here, and then you're gonna have your same gradual hill on this side. Okay, so this is time reversal. Basically, in short, oof. Um, let me draw this again. Okay, so ignoring the drawn fiascos, we basically have that x of t right here gets converted to x of minus t. Time shifting. A signal x of t can be shifted in time by some amount t1 greater than zero. Okay, so let me give you an example here. Let's use black ink for this. Here we have our axis. This is t. I'm going to start with x of t. This is time zero. If the signal arrives after time zero, let's say the peak is at time zero, but if the peak arrives after time zero, then we call that a delayed signal, which we will denote in red. So a delayed signal might have a peak that's over here, and therefore the signal might look something like this. Okay, you can assume that these are to scale and the widths are the same. In contrast, if the peak arrives earlier, this would be known as an advanced signal. In this case, the peak might be here, and you end up with this. Let's denote this peak as arriving at minus T1, and this peak as arriving at T1. So in both cases, we've shifted the signal by some amount T1. Now, if I wanna shift it uh, so that the signal is advanced by T1 or delayed by T1, it becomes a sign change. In other words, we have two quantities that we look at. The first is if I take X of T and I wanna shift it, what I do is I shift the argument variable, which is time. So I have x of t minus t1. Okay. I can also shift it the other way by doing x of t plus t1. t plus t1. I realize my pluses and t's look very similar. Okay. So x of t minus t1 and x of t plus t1. So which one is advanced versus delayed? Well, let's think about it. x of t minus t1, uh, we're saying that this is the peak. So in our x marks the spot uh, example, we're looking at this x right here. We're looking at the x marks the spot at x of zero. So we wanna see when 
x of zero occurs at different shifts. So if I have x of t minus t1, the question is, when does x of zero occur? When does this equal x of zero? Well, this equals x of zero when t equals t1. Okay, You can just see that when t equals t1, this argument here goes to zero. Therefore, this one is the red signal. The red signal, remember, has the x marks the spot at occurring at t1. In contrast, if I have t plus t1, this equals x of 0 when? It equals x of 0 when t equals minus t1. Okay, that is time shifting. And to summarize, if you have a signal and you have a subtraction in the argument, you are delaying it in time by t1. The way I always think of it is if I have a subtraction in the argument, I'm shifting a function to the right-hand side, which is delaying it. If I have a plus sign uh, of a shift, if I have a positive shift as shown here, then I am advancing the signal by t1. As you work on time shift examples, it makes a lot of sense to choose like a reference point, like an X marks the spot. And oftentimes the best X marks the spot is right at T equals zero, right? So I would pick this as the X marks the spot and see where that X occurs at different shifts. Okay, let's talk about combining operations. So let me give you a hypothetical signal. Let me start with a signal So this axis is time. So I have, let's say one, two, three, minus one, minus two, minus three. And I have a signal like a box, we'll call it, it's called a boxcar function or a rect function. And the peak of this arises at one, let's make it simple. So the amplitude is at one. This is one, two, three, minus one, minus two, minus three. So the question for you to check your understanding what is x of t minus one? Okay, if I were to draw that with a picture, what is x of two t minus one? two in parentheses, t minus one. Okay, so if I look at this, there's several ways to approach this. I can uh, do something called PEMDAS, right? I'm gonna give you a reasonable way to approach this and we'll see if it's right or wrong. So we could do PEMDAS and we could essentially do the operations that are first in the parentheses, exponents, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, right? So if we start with PEMDAS, it starts with P. So we start with what's in the parentheses. So what's in the parentheses tells us that we have T minus one. So now if we were to go along this reasonable path, we might say, okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the, what's in the parentheses. And what the parentheses is telling me to do is telling me to do a shift by one. It's gonna tell me to delay the signal by one. So now if I look at my new signal, so I have my axes here. This is at zero, this is two. Now my signal in red is going to be delayed. Okay, so I've done operation one, which is uh, shifted by one unit to the right hand side or delayed. So now the next thing I might do is the next operation, which is 
what's outside the parentheses is a multiplication by two. So let's say this is one. So now the next thing I'm gonna do is operation two. Multiplication by two. So in this case, what I would do is I would have the same axes here. And let me just clarify, this is multiplication of the time variable by two. So this is time scaling. What that's going to do is, since I'm multiplying by two, that's a positive, uh, that's a number that is greater than one. Therefore, it's going to compress my signal. So one way to quickly shorthand compression is to take your original signal and look at the left-hand side limit here and the left-hand side limit here as your X marks the spots, and then essentially divide that number by what the scaling factor is. So the left-hand side X marks the spot would be at zero divided by two, and the right-hand side X marks the spot would be at two divided by two. So my new signal spans zero to one like this. And it's the same height. So now you could say that uh, this representation x of 2 t minus 1 has been preserved, right? So this would be x of t minus 1. And let's call this uh, signal z of t. And this is q of t. All right, so now the question for you, CYU, check your understanding. Is the professor correct in using PEMDAS? Okay, so did I make a mistake or have I correctly applied PEMDAS and uh, gotten the answer to the original check your understanding question, which is, what is x of uh, two in parentheses t minus one? Uh, take a moment, maybe you know, 15, 20 seconds, and think about whether this method is correct or not. Okay, welcome back. So welcome back. Now, let me answer the check your understanding question. Was I correct in applying this reasonable strategy of using PEMDAS to apply the different delays and scalings? The answer is no, I was not correct. And how will we check that we were not correct or not? Well, what we would do is we would always look at our X marks the spots. So in this particular case, if we look at the signal, the X marks the spot of this original function in black. So now my cursor is hovering over the original signal. So I'm gonna draw an X marks the spot right about here. So this is an X marks the spot, and this is an X marks the spot. These are the two unique distinguishing features of the original signal. One is on the left-hand side, the other is on the right-hand side. And if I look at this, these two X marks the spots, these transitions occur at T equals minus one and T equals plus one. So X of T transitions at T equals minus one and T equals plus one. So let's look at when the argument is gonna equal minus one and plus one. So if we look at our argument, two t minus one, that's the argument of the desired signal after the combined operation. So two in parentheses t minus one should equal minus one. And we just have to figure out where, what that t is. So this equals minus one when t equals, let's see, we can quickly do this. Uh, that's 2t minus 2 equals minus 1, uh, 2t equals 1, so therefore t equals 0 
Similarly, we can calculate when 2t minus 1, the argument of the shifted signal, is going to equal plus 1, and that occurs at t equals 1.5. If we look at our output signal that we have estimated, this was our estimate. It was up here. If we look at the estimate, the estimate has transitions at 0 and 1. This is not correct, right? Because we should expect the estimate to have transitions at 0 0.5 and 1.5. Therefore, the idea of simply applying PEMDAS doesn't work when you have combined operations. So this is an incorrect method. OK, let's see how we can combine operations correctly. What I'm going to do is I'm going to redraw that signal. Here I have time. I have minus one to plus one. And I have a simple signal. So if I look at x of the goal here, please remember, and I'll write this in purple so that it's more clear. The goal is to estimate Not estimate, but obtain x of 2 in parentheses t minus 1. So the strategy when you have this is always expand. Goal 1 is always expand parentheses. and remove them, okay? So therefore, we would now be left with x of 2t minus 2. The second goal is to always shift before scaling. Then we can apply scaling re reversal. So one way to look at this is what we are doing in this correct method, so this is the correct method, is the exact opposite of PEMDAS, right? We're first getting rid of the parentheses so it's a non-factor, then we're dealing with the addition term, which is due to shifting, and then finally we're doing scaling or reversal. Okay, which is multiplication of the time variable. So let's look at how this would be in action. So if I look at the first step, we've done that x of 2t minus 2. So we now have already done the first step. Now let's do step number two, always shift. So if I do step number two, I'm going to end up with a signal that goes from plus 1 plus three, okay? All right, so this is step two. So now step two has been applied. Finally, we're gonna to go to step three, which is scaling by two. So this is step one was expand parentheses. Step two is shifting. Step three, scaling. That's going to give us our final output. So if I look at scaling, now I have my signal. So I want to scale what I had at the end of step two, which is the red signal, into something different, right? It's going to be scaled by two. So if I'm doing scaling, now let's see what a factor of two in the scaling is going to do to my term. Well, originally, the left-hand side limit here, the x marks the spot, and the x marks the spot, was at 1 and 3. 
And effectively, now we know that the new x marks the spots are going to be at one divided by the scaling factor and three divided by the scaling factor, right? So it would be this divided by two, this divided by two. Now that would show up as 0 0.5 and 1.5. And so this signal right here is my answer to the question. Okay. And you can see that it agrees with my x marks the spot here and my x marks the spot here. They are both at 0 0.5 and 1.5. Okay, so there's a little bit of a nuance to combining operations. You kind of have to throw PEMDAS out of the water and get rid of any parentheses and then do exactly the opposite of PEMDAS. That's kind of the way that I remember it. Okay, excellent. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with PEMDAS, uh, I think we use that term a lot in American high schools. Um, PEMDAS is order of operations and you can just Google that on Wikipedia. If you don't remember what PEMDAS is. Great. Now we're going to talk about even and odd signals. So we're jumping to a different topic now to build a foundation. For those of you who, for whom this is basic, feel free to fast forward the video or even skip this lecture if need be. OK, an even signal is a signal that has time symmetry. What that means is at time t equals zero, the left-hand side, anything less than t equals zero is equal to anything to the right of t equals zero. So it's symmetric about t equals zero. Mathematically, you can write this as x of t is equal to x of minus t. Okay. So if the signal is even, you have this relationship in purple. Now, there's also something called an odd signal. An odd signal has this very unique property that it is actually anti-symmetric about the origin. If it's anti-symmetric, what that means is x of t equals minus x of minus t. So let's break this down for a moment by drawing an intermediate signal. The first step is let's understand what x of minus t looks like graphically. So I'm gonna plot that here. It's going to be here, then it's going to go up like this. It's going to continue here, and then it's going to go down like this, right? Remember, this was signal. Okay, remember that this was a reversal of your signal. Okay, now to take the green signal, x of minus t, and make it equal to the black signal, we simply need to add a negative sign in front. And that's exactly what we have done here. Okay. So for example, let's, let's try to make x of minus t equal to x of t. So if I look at the green signal, what operation do I need to add to that? Well, I need to somehow take this and flip it about the axis. I need to do inversion. And inversion is nothing but more than just putting a negative one in front of the signal. Therefore, this is another intuition for what it means to be anti-symmetric. And anti-symmetric has been flipped using time reversal and then also flipped on the, uh, about the y-axis, uh, about the horizontal axis using inversion. So we have reversal and then we have inversion. Now, what we can also do is we can start to deal with even and odd decompositions. So let's say that I have a signal. Let us call this signal x of t. Now, x of t will have two axes. Here's my time axis, and the signal might take the form of something like this. Okay, so that's pretty close to what it is. Yeah, on the next slide. 
All right, so that's a fairly good drawing. So x of t now is going to be equal to a decomposition. So it turns out that for any signal, I can actually decompose it into the sum of two different signals. I can decompose it into the sum of an even and an odd signal. So x of t in blue is going to be equal to x e of t, which is an even signal, plus x o of t, which is an odd signal. All right, so let us break this down. The first check your understanding. Those of you who want to go a little deeper, how would you look at proving this? Can you prove this holds for all x of t? So can you prove that for any signal, it can be broken down into the sum of some sort of even signal and some sort of odd signal? Let me actually erase this. Let me just write this explicitly. Uh, this, this symbol here is for all. It's just a shorthand, and we'll use it. So for any signal, x of t. Okay. So please feel free, those of you who want to attempt this question, to pause the video and see if you would have a strategy to prove this. OK, welcome back. So welcome back, and let's see if we can prove that this holds. The first step is, if we want to prove that the left-hand side here, one way to look at proofs is you're basically trying, this check your understanding question, this, this, this block here, is basically trying to say that this equation is going to hold uh, for all x of t. So if, if I'm trying to prove that this equation holds, one way to do that is uh, to start bridging the divide between the left-hand side of an equation and the right-hand side of an equation. So if we look here, the left-hand side of the equation has x of t in it. The right-hand side of the equation does not have x of t. So as a first step, I might want to start writing the right-hand side of the equation to have x of t. So let's do that for the even signal. So if I have an even signal, x e of t, well, let's write x e of t as in terms of x of t. So the question, those of you who want to attempt this, can you write x e of t in terms of x of t? OK. So. Let's think about how we can write x e of t in terms of x of t. Well, we know by definition that in the top left here, I'm going to write that x of t equals x of minus t. Okay, So we know that holds. So therefore, we can simply write the even signal as 1 half times x of t plus x of minus t. Similarly, we can write the odd signal, x o of t, as 1 half times x of t minus x of minus t. Remember, because it was anti-symmetric. So this is how we can write these signals. Now, clearly, this signal is even. And one way to do that is you can simply check. You can just simply show that x e of t equals x e of minus t, right? If you wanted to check, if you check. Likewise, the odd signal is also odd. And although I'm saying something really simple, the odd signal is odd, what I'm really trying to get at is that if you were not told 
that there was a subscript O here, right? If you were not told that that subscript O means that the signal is odd, a signal with this mathematical form is odd, okay? And you can again check that if you like, because x o of minus t equals one half x of minus t minus x of t, which equals minus one half x of t minus x of minus t, which equals minus x o of t. Therefore, XO of minus T equals minus XO of minus T. Excuse me, uh, remove this minus sign here. XO of T equals minus XO of minus T. Okay, very good. Now, if I look at this representation, if I were to add up the even and odd signals, you can also verify that if I take this and I have a plus sign here, if I add up this, one half x of t plus one half x of minus t plus one half x of t uh, and so on, what I actually end up with is x of t. So here's that example again, okay? Here I have a signal in black, and my goal is given this signal in black, x of t, I want to show that I can decompose this into an even signal plus an odd signal. In particular, the check your understanding example is asking CYU, what's, oops. The check your understanding is asking specifically what is XE of T and XO of T, okay? So what specifically is x e of t and x o of t? So we can do this because if we know what x of t is, we can actually draw what x e of t and x o of t would look like. So x e of t, remember, equals one half of x of t plus, I'm gonna use the color purple here, x of minus t. All right, so now let's look at this graphically. Uh, the first step might be, I wanna draw what the purple signal looks like, and then I just want to add them up and divide by two. So the purple signal is gonna be a flip version about the y equals zero axis of x of t. So that might look something like the following. So let's say that this is an x marks the spot. That is gonna flip here, okay, in the purple signal. This is gonna flip here, okay. We're gonna end up with this um, uh, ramp that goes from, so here it goes from one to three, right? So it goes, now it goes from minus one to minus three. And on this side, it just goes straight down. Okay, so this purple signal is the flip version of x of t. And so if I add up the purple and the black signal, this is actually what I get. So let's add that up and draw what x of t, x even of t looks like, right? This is the decomposition So here, this is t equals one. This is, let's say, t equals three. Let's roughly get the scale a little bit better. This is t equals one. 
oops, right here is t equals one. Okay. So now uh, here I have one half. If I just draw this, I can look and I'm kind of mentally adding up what the purple and blue signal, purple and black signal added up divided by two are going to be, and it's going to be something like this. And notice that I've only drawn the right hand side half. Because I know this function is even, I can just complete the rest by symmetry. Right? And this would, by definition of symmetry, would occur at minus three and minus one. Okay. Now let us analyze what the odd signal would look like. The odd signal that forms the other even odd decomposition pair. So XO of T is gonna equal one half of our black signal X of T minus the purple signal. Okay. So that signal is going to look something like the following. Okay. This is one, this is three. So let's look at the right hand side. I'm just going to mentally flip and add these. Okay, and then scale by one half, and I end up with something like the following. And since this is odd by symmetry, I know that this has got to be anti-symmetric. Okay, excellent. So now if I take this red signal here and add it to the green signal, I'm gonna get back my original black signal. Okay, periodic signals. Let's just, uh, this is an extra slide if we needed extra space so we can skip slide. Periodic signals. The concept of periodic signals is very important in this class and it will show up frequently. Colloquially, these are signals that repeat after some given interval t0. Uh, more formally, we can define this as the following. A continuous signal if and only if there exists a T zero greater than zero such that X of T plus T zero This symbol here means there exists. Okay. Great. So this holds for all T. Remember that this symbol meant for all. In this particular example, T0 is called the period of X of T. This is a formal definition of periodicity. Let us look at this in a concrete example where it may make more sense. So for example, if I draw a plot, let me make this plot nice and wide. So I have time here. So let's say I have a signal. 
And let me draw a signal in red here. Um, so here we have one period. Okay. Here we have another. Here we have another. Okay. Let us assume that each of these are drawn to scale, meaning each of these hills, these red hills, one, two, three here, these are all drawn the same. Like, you know, my drawing is not precise, precisely correct, but assume that each of these bumps is perfectly uniform. In this case, the signal is periodic. What we can do is we can take a timestamp here. Like I'm going to pick some t. Let's just call this time t1. And if I look at t1, the signal, if I just keep walking along the signal, I'm going to find a corresponding point for t1 right here. Okay, And this equals t1 plus t0. And if I keep walking along the signal, I'm going to find the corresponding point. And this is t1 plus 2t0. Okay. So this signal is periodic. I can do that with any point. For example, I can take this peak here, and I can walk along the peak. This is t2. And this peak occurs at t2 plus t0. I can keep walking along the peak. And this point occurs at t2 plus 2t0. Now, what happens if I add a wrinkle? Okay, let's say I draw another signal that looks basically identical. But let me just add this little kind of notch in the top of the hill. So now let us analyze what happened to T1. If I look at T1, if I add T0 to T1, I get to the same corresponding point on the next hill. If I add T0 to that next hill, I get again to a subsequent hill. And once again, if I add another T0, then indeed I do end up at T1 plus 3T0. So if we do look at this signal in terms of just T1, uh, it would seem like the signal is periodic. But this is not a periodic signal as we would imagine, right? A periodic signal basically means that it copies itself over and over and over again. In this case, the new copy of the signal over here has this notch. And that notch is, is clearly unique. So the point that we were missing, if we just look at this point here, T1, is that this periodicity definition needs to hold for all T. So I should be able to pick any T on the curve and see that uh, I can have this replication property. So in this case, let's pick T2. T2 is the peak, right? So if I look at the peak of the first hill, it maps to the peak of the second hill, which maps to the peak of the third hill, which does not map to the peak of the fourth hill because there is no such peak there. Therefore, the signal is not periodic by definition. This is an aperiodic signal. So when showing periodicity, it is important to realize that the definition applies for all t, right? It's not, there's no such thing as partial periodicity. OK, periodic signals have properties of their own. Let's suppose that t is periodic. So say x of t is periodic. In this case, x of t plus t naught would, by definition, equal x of t for all t. Okay. Remember, once again, this symbol means for all. So now the question you might ask to check your understanding is, knowing nothing else about the signal, so we don't know what the signal looks like, what is x of t plus 2t dot? So why don't you try to see what the answer is? And those of you who get the answer, feel free to pause the video and see if you can prove it analytically.
Okay, welcome back to the video. Many of you may have guessed that the answer to this is probably going to be x of t. The harder question is, can we prove this? Well, let's dissect this signal for a moment. Let's keep this as a question mark and let's write down the next line of this equality. Clearly, x of t plus 2t0 equals x of t plus t naught plus t naught by definition. Now, let's apply variable substitution. Let us say there exists a t prime such that t prime is defined as t plus t0. This symbol of an equality with a triangle means a definition. Okay, so I'm going to define the symbol with an apostrophe t prime to equal t plus t0. Now, defined as such, we can rewrite this equality as x. And let me just rewrite this in a color so it's more clear. So suppose there exists a t prime defined as t plus t0. Then we have x of t prime plus t0. Now, it turns out that this can be further simplified. So the next line of this equation, x of t prime plus t0, is another check your understanding question. So check your understanding. What is x of t prime plus t0 equal to? Okay, welcome back. X of t prime plus t0. Actually, it turns out that this simply equals x of t prime. This follows from the property of periodicity, where x of t plus t0 equals x of t for all t. And that for all t means that it should also hold for some uh, t prime that I've arbitrarily defined. So that's how you get from this equality to this equality. Okay, so now we have x of t plus 2t0 equals x of t prime. Now we can back substitute the definition of x of t prime. Remember that x of t prime was nothing but t plus t0. And we further know from the property of periodicity once more, x of t plus t0 is going to equal x of t. Okay. And this completes the proof. One of the things that you should become hopefully quite familiar with after taking this class is the sine or cosine wave. This occurs in many, many engineering applications and we will use it extensively so it's worth reviewing properties. A cosine is defined by the following. A cosine is defined as x of t equals a cosine omega t minus some theta. In this particular case, a is some amplitude term, t is the time variable, and omega is something called an angular frequency in units of radians per second. We can also write this in terms of hertz frequencies. For example, 
x of t equals a cosine 2 pi of t minus theta. In this case, f is a frequency and it has units of hertz. It should be apparent that the relation between omega and f is omega equals 2 pi f. f is also related to the period, fundamental period of a wave. Okay, let me draw an example of a cosine wave to give you some intuition. Let's suggest, suppose that we have a axis here and I'm gonna draw an axis like this. And the goal is to draw a wave in blue. Let's use blue in here. And I wanna draw an x of t equals four cosine two pi one half t minus zero. This is a cosine wave with a period of two seconds, a frequency of one half hertz, and an amplitude of four. In this case, the signal will look something like the following. Here we have four. The cosine reaches its peak amplitude, assuming there's no phase delay at zero. So here you have zero. By the time that we go through one full cycle of the cosine wave, so if we look at one full period, This is a full period of the cosine, and this is gonna occur at two seconds. Okay. And then we're essentially going to repeat a copy of this and so on. So this would occur at minus two and so on. If we wanna look at a inversion of the signal, how would we do that? Well, let's say y of t equals minus x of t. In this particular case, what will you do? Well, an inversion could be drawn like the following. It's gonna have the same zero crossings. But it's gonna be inverted. It's very important when you deal with signals that you expand the parentheses properly. So when you shift, so if you wanna come up with a new signal that is a shift, so let's say I have a Z and Z of T equals, let's say X of T shifted by one unit. In this particular example, if I look at x of t shifted by one unit, I actually do not simply take this wave and shift it by one unit, okay? What I have to actually do is I have to always expand out any parentheses. So in this case, z of t equals four cosine of pi t minus one. And what's gonna happen here is you're going to end up with four cosine of pi t minus pi. So in this particular example, you can see that the shift is not just simply shifting the cosine by one unit, but you're actually shifting it by pi units for the function z of t. So as a check your understanding question, you can also ask if z of t equals y of t. So there are other pro properties that you may want to become familiar with from trigonometry. Uh, these are a few properties. Many of you would have seen these. Let's just do a deeper dive into the second bullet. 
So if you look at cosine theta or sine theta, it's pretty important after you take this class to know whether they're even or odd. When we talk about Fourier transforms and Fourier series, this intuition will become relevant. So is cosine theta an even or an odd function? It turns out that this function is even and sine is an odd function. We can see that quite simply on the last slide. Remember on the last slide, the blue wave was the cosine. And we can see that the blue wave is symmetric about uh, the y-axis here at t equals zero. Sometimes we will be interested in this class in taking a small segment of an aperiodic signal and making replications of that. So we may replicate it by extending it periodically. Here we have taken a small signal that is aperiodic. This is aperiodic because it's just one segment. segment and now we have done a replication. Again, this will come into much greater detail when we learn about Fourier transforms in a later lecture. Okay, as a check your understanding question, something that you can ask yourself or you can quiz with friends is if the sum of two signals is periodic. So let's say that you have two signals. Let's say you have x1 with a period of t1 and then you have x2 with the period of t2. So the question is, if I have x1 plus x2, or let's be formal here, let's say x1 of t plus x2 of t, is this periodic? So take some time and do this. And at the start of next lecture, we will cover this checker understanding question. Okay, thanks for your understanding and see you next time.